today. Dale Russell also detected one other feature on the inner surface of the Troodon skull. The brain that left its mark there showed the beginnings of folding. The more complex a brain, the more folded its surface, as epitomized in human beings. The complexity of Troodon's brain was approaching that of some modern birds and mammals. What did a small predator do with all that brain power? It processed information from its highly developed senses, especially vision. With eyes that faced forward, Troodon had more refined depth perception than other dinosaurs. The ability to see in three dimensions was critical when leaping at fast-moving prey, like small mammals. Troodon's eyes were also very large, an indication it was probably a creature of the night. Seventy million years ago, Troodon was perhaps better equipped than any other dinosaur to stalk the dark. With its keen senses and small stature, it could have crept into places thick with underbrush, where giant killers like T-Rex could hardly venture. Here, small prey scurried, and Troodon was king. Bone by bone, bit by bit, Craig Durstler and his team are reconstructing the life and times of some of the last dinosaurs to walk the earth. For Dale Russell, Dragon's Grave provides the first detailed information on Troodon's habitat, its food resources, and the other creatures who shared this environment. Today, excavations are focused on a bone bed filled primarily with the remains of hadrosaurs, huge duck-billed dinosaurs. The species that thrived here at Dragon's Grave was Edmontosaurus, a plant eater. It stood 20 feet high and weighed three or more tons. Back then, Dragon's Grave was a river delta teeming with life. Herds of Edmontosaurus grazed the vegetation that grew near water's edge. Occasionally, a monstrous T-Rex would crash through the swamps and kill one of the large duckbills. Others succumbed to old age or disease. As they died, Edmontosaurus were washed into the water. In time, their bones became part of the natural levees that formed throughout the delta. A living example of this environment is the swampy ecosystem of Louisiana, Craig Durstler's home state. The natural levee deposit that you can see immediately behind me is the kind of environment where the duckbill bones were accumulating. All you have to do is take this sediment, the bones which would have been incorporated inside, the plant debris, which is very obviously growing and accumulating in this area, and put the duckbills into it as well, put the troodons in, and voila. The environment is virtually identical to what it was like 65, 66 million years ago when troodon was roaming, living, taking care of its young in Wyoming. Durstler sees Troodon as the dinosaur equivalent of a cunning present-day predator in the Louisiana Bayou. If you look for an analogy in terms of not just what they ate, but in terms of their functional abilities, in terms of their intelligence and so on, the best analog that we can find are coyotes. And that's one reason why Troodons are sometimes referred to as coyote dinosaurs. They're cunning, they're quick, they solve problems rapidly, they modify their behavior at, a, at the drop of a hat. It seems reasonable to push that for troodonts as well, because in this environment, in this, in this late Cretaceous southern Louisiana here, that we have here in Wyoming, you have troodonts as small, nimble, 
and the most intelligent creatures in the area. Like a two-legged coyote, Troodon flourished in the rich environment that was Dragon's Grave. The natural levee that the Troodons apparently were living on when they got incorporated into the bone bed uh, was certainly one of those supermarket or grocery store environments with all the plants, with all the insects that were there, certainly all the small animals that were available, certainly the duck bill or possibly the duck bill carcasses as well. Uh, it was just a great place to live. It was a great place certainly to raise young as well. Because of the, because of the uh, slate elevation on the natural levees, it was also a great place to, uh, for mothers to watch out for danger when they were taking care of the young. Troodon mothers may have laid their eggs near the banks of the levee, where the carcasses of duckbills piled up. In this way, Troodon young would have hatched to a ready source of food. The adult Troodon probably fed on a variety of fare, plants, insects, and our ancestors, the early mammals. During the Cretaceous period, mammals were small insect eaters whose sole refuge was the night. Most large killer dinosaurs had poor night vision. Then, Troodon arrived on the scene. Little escaped its acute eyesight, its nimble, grasping hands. The mammals had nowhere to hide. Master of the dark, Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. The coyote dinosaur might eventually have slowed the evolution of mammals to a dead stop. We will never know, for Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. This dinosaurian community, with, in its, really in its flush of youth, was also a final expression of the beauty of the dinosaurian world, because just after the moment in time represented by this locality, a great extinction swept the surface of the Earth. Scientists have yet to solve the mystery of the dinosaur's demise. Asteroids, volcanoes, or viruses may be to blame. Only the outcome is clear. By 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were gone. But the story of Troodon does not end here at Dragon's Grave. It launches us into the future, from the dinosaur age to the space age.